Good afternoon, everybody. Well, earlier on, we, we had some great talks about the economic history of warfare, um, as well as the future of defense in Europe. And as Annette mentioned, I've been on the advisory board of the Mises Institute uh, for a few years. And we've done some interesting events on emerging technologies. For instance, uh, we did an event in the European Parliament in 2020 on the economics of artificial intelligence. And a year before that, I also organized the roundtable discussions in the European Parliament on, on AI, where we had the IMF and the UN and the OECD, among others, attending. But you may well be thinking, what does the economics of artificial intelligence have to do with the future of warfare? Well, I think what we'll see over the next generation or so is that the economics of AI is going to drive many of the most profound changes that we're going to see in society, in the economy, and also in the nature of warfare. And actually, one of the events uh, that, I, that I spoke at on AI was in Washington, DC, called the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, which is the main AI body there. And the, the board for, for that includes uh, NASA and most parts of the US military and intelligence. And I stayed in touch with a few of them on this theme of the economics of AI driving these changes. Uh, and I think the changes are going to be quite profound. We're now seeing some of the first military robots, uh, which really are at a level where they could be deployed fairly soon in coming years. But as you may well also be aware, it's not just the West that's working on these technologies. For instance, at China's National Defense University, where they train the next generation of military officers, one of their lecturers, Li Minghai, said, and I quote, through gunpowder smoke in war, we can perceive that today, war fighting has evolved from bloody struggle for storming castles and capturing territories in the uncivilized and barbaric age into information-driven precision decapitation operations and intense contests in the domain of high intelligence. And one of the other thinkers then at China's National Defense University also said that in the future, China plans on winning wars by shifting the emphasis in war fighting from, quote, systems confrontation to, quote, algorithms competition, and that achieving superiority in algorithms ultimately will produce, quote, war fighting superiority. So we could view this as a continuum in the evolution of warfare that has taken place in hundreds or even thousands of years. Warfare began in the Stone Age with fists and clubs, and then moved to projectiles for instance, bows and arrows and spears, and then to gunpowder and cannons, and air force and tanks, uh, and then, of course, the epoch of nuclear weapons. And this next epoch, then, of automated algorithmic war fighting uh, will bring about just as profound changes. So there's going to be three parts to my talk today. First of all, I'm going to talk through likely progressions in AI over the next generation or so, looking in particular at the economics of artificial intelligence. Then second of all, I'm going to look at likely developments in military strategy, given, uh, given these developments in AI. And then third of all, I'll look at what, why, what might we be able to do to safeguard the future for ourselves and children and grandchildren, given these developments. So onto the first part of my talk then, looking at some likely progressions in the development of AI in the coming years. Artificial intelligence is what economic historians call a general purpose technology. That means it will feed into many different areas of the economy. What this also means is that in general, innovations that take place in the private sector will also lead to military applications and vice versa. But nevertheless, predictions in AI in the past have proven notoriously difficult. For instance, Marvin Minsky, who was a professor at MIT 
and one of the founding fathers of the field of artificial intelligence, famously in the 1960s, gave one of his graduate students a summer research project of solving the problem of image recognition, that is, being able to tell the difference between a, a dog and a cat, for instance. And that actually took several decades and thousands of researchers before that could be done reliably. But there are, there are still reliable trends that we can look at in order to make predictions about the future of AI. Perhaps the most famous of these is Moore's Law. And Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel and also Fairchild Semiconductors in uh, two of the major chip, uh, chip manufacturers in Silicon Valley. And in 1965, he wrote a paper where he posited that the number of transistors that would fit on an integrated circuit was doubling roughly every two years or so. And actually, when you combine this with some other effects in the economics of chip manufacturing, it means that you often get a doubling in computational power even faster than every two years. So that's why, for instance, the smartphone in your pocket uh, is, is effectively a more powerful computer than the most, the, the most powerful computers in the world just a couple of generations ago. But actually, there has been a slowing of Moore's law in, in recent years. So one of the other thinkers that's important to look at then is called Ray Kurzweil. And Ray Kurzweil wrote several books on the different paradigms that have taken place and will take place in the evolution of computers. So there was relay computers, then vacuum tube computers, then transistors and integrated circuits. And just as the exponential growth in this particular phase is coming to an end, Kurzweil would argue the, the next paradigm will take over, which is likely to be uh, three-dimensional computer chips and also quantum computing and also chips that are made specifically for AI applications. But there's another idea that Kurzweil talks about which is useful for us to understand in mapping out these likely developments. And that is this idea that the human brain is not very good at thinking through exponential trends. So our brains evolved on the African savanna about 100,000 years ago, and they tend to think sequentially. So if you take a, a sequential trend, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, when you get to the 10th iteration, you're at 10, when you get to the 20th iteration, you're at 20, and so on. If you take an exponential trend of doubling, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, when you get to the 10th iteration, you're at more than 1,000. When you get to the 20th iteration, you're at more than a million. And at the 30th iteration, you're at more than a billion. So you can see how, uh, whereas your smartphone is more powerful uh, than the most powerful supercomputers just a couple of generations ago, if this trend of doubling continues after another 30 iterations, computers will be a billion times as powerful as they are today. But nevertheless, if we, if we dig a little deeper into this, uh, beyond just the power of computation, another thinker that's useful for us to, to consider is John Launchbury. And John Launchbury was head of the Information Innovation Office at DARPA, which is the part of the US military that focuses on high-tech projects. In essence, it's, it's like a research and development department and a think tank rolled into one. And John Launchbury discussed how artificial intelligence is likely to have three distinct waves that it will progress through. First, there was uh, the first wave involved handcrafted AI. So that's human beings actually programming into the AI how it will operate. So if we think of a concrete example for a moment, um, AI that plays chess, all of the different openings and so on are programmed into it. Uh, and it can get very good, of course, but it's still limited as it can't learn effectively. So we then move into the second wave of AI which John Launchbury calls statistical learning. 
uh, which is often now called machine learning. And in this, in this wave, uh, for instance, if we stay with the example of AI that plays chess, it can learn either from looking at other games that have been played previously, or in some cases, uh, by playing itself over and over again, thousands or millions of times. And through that methodology, it will outperform even the best human chess players. But there are still significant limitations with this second wave of AI. For instance, in order for, for this second wave of AI to tell the difference between a dog and a cat, it may need to see a, a million images of a dog and a million images of a cat. Whereas, of course, a human child uh, can tell the difference after just a few examples, or maybe, maybe even just seeing one example of a dog and a cat. So we then move into the third wave of AI, which is contextual adaptation. So with our chess example, it no longer needs to learn purely through trial and error. It understands the context within which it is operating, so it can be more strategic in that sense. So much of uh, what becomes famous in science fiction is effectively in this third wave of AI, uh, which we may well soon be heading into. And so in a sense, it's analogous to biological evolution, I would argue, in that uh, the more basic biological organisms, like insects, generally have their behavior mostly hard-coded into them, into their nervous system. And then you, you get more evolved organisms, for instance, um, more mammals and, uh, and many sea creatures that can learn and that can adapt to their environment, but they still learn in a Pavlovian way. Uh, so you then have the third wave, let's say, which is human beings, and arguably, to a certain extent, some other species, uh, where if you get an electric shock from, from a raw cable, you don't need to keep touching it 30 times until you get Pavlovian conditioning. You understand the context. So as AI moves into this third wave, things will become radically different uh, from this current second wave that we're in now. And so with that in mind, then, I'll move on to the second part of my talk, which is on military strategy in the age of AI, taking these different likely developments into account. Now, in my introduction, I mentioned one of the thinkers at China's National Defense University, Li Minghai. And I'm going to borrow another quote from him now. He said, uh, and I'll quote verbatim, victories in AI warfare will be scored through bringing forward the time of issuing early warnings, shortening the period of decision making, and extending operational actions, thus producing the effects of making preemptive deployments and launching preemptive attacks. So what he's essentially saying is, in this age that we're moving into, speed of decision making will be key. Now, of course, that's been the case in previous military epochs, for instance, Napoleon Bonaparte at the Battle of Austerlitz was able to outmaneuver the combined forces of Russia and Austria to a large extent through speedier decision making than them uh, and therefore being able to take the Prats and Heights. But if we have another analogy then with the economics of AI, if we think about modern hedge funds, uh, now a good hedge fund manager can look at current political events uh, and will be able to make decisions quickly uh, and enable the hedge fund to adapt to those. But if we think about an AI hedge fund, decision making may well be taking place in thousands or even millionths of a second. And that will also apply more and more to this new age of warfare. So when we think of uh, military robots, what many people often have in mind is the type of humanoid robots that you may see in the Terminator movies uh, and so on. Whereas in actual fact, uh, one of the most likely uh, initial deployments is going to be swarms of drones. And this may well be swarms of, of many thousands and thousands of drones of different sizes. Uh, first of all, the, the types of size of drones that you're used to and that you can buy off the internet, but also smaller drones, for instance, the size of a bird, but also even drones the size of insects. So, when uh, 
campaign groups, for instance, the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, they're a very worthwhile group and worth, certainly worth listening to. They say they campaign for the idea that we should have meaningful human control behind every military robot. But I think you can see with, for instance, swarms of thousands of drones, once you start replacing battlefield warfighters um, with robots, with, with swarms of drones, you inevitably move to a system where tactical decision making has to also be, be automated because decision making has to coordinate these thousands of drones and has to take place in thousands of a second. But as we'll see in a moment, that also to a certain extent leads to an automation in strategic decision making as well. So to return to our example of Napoleon Bonaparte at Austerlitz, uh, in the future, the key to, to winning in this age will be taking the algorithmic Pratts and Heights. That is where the decision making of your side is faster and more effective. And we're talking about speed as in thousandths or even millionths of a second. And this also will be the case in cyber warfare, uh, as increasingly cyber defenses are also automated. And we'll hear more about that uh, shortly. But one other concept then from the economics of AI, which is useful to understand in, in this world that we're moving into, is the idea of machina economicus. Now in economics, we tend to model things around an idea, uh, the concept of homo economicus. That is uh, someone who is perfectly rational and utility maximizing. Now we all know that type of person doesn't really exist. Human beings are driven by complex emotions and by primitive impulses and everything in between. But again, if you think about AI hedge funds, they are actually in many respects hyper-rational. And the same will be true for many of these areas of algorithmic warfare. Uh, so removing emotional human beings from the decision-making chain has, has significant payoffs. But it also means some of the areas of economics uh, that have been used in the past, for instance, game theory, which was used during the Cold War for formulating nuclear strategies. Its, its effectiveness in many domains has been, has been questionable because of the nature of human beings not being rational utility maximizers. But in this world of algorithmic warfare that we move into, these types of areas of economics will become more and more applicable for, for designing strategies. And so then on to the third and final part of my talk today, which is given these likely developments, what can we do to safeguard against disaster for ourselves and children and grandchildren? Well, if we for a moment think about some previous epochs of military history, I want you to imagine for a second that there are four quadrants uh, and, and that the dividing lines are, first of all, is it a, a defensive or an offensive military epoch? And second of all, uh, does it tend towards stable or unstable equilibria? And what do I mean by that? Well, if, if we think about World War I for a moment, that was very much a defensive military epoch. So launching offensive actions in World War I was hugely costly in terms of deaths and also economic cost. If we think about World War II then, uh, comparatively, it was, it was more of an offensive military epoch where through the air force uh, and tanks, in essence, very quickly, even in a matter of weeks in World War II, uh, Germany was able to essentially uh, take an empire roughly the size of Julius Caesar. That was not a type of warfare where you wanted to sit there being defensive. So the Maginot Line, which had been built uh, for defense, would have been very effective in World War I, uh, but not for that offensive military epoch. But I also then, if we, if we think about the nuclear military epoch, that was obviously highly offensive. Uh, that was not a type of, uh, that was not an epoch where you wanted to sit there being defensive, but also the equilibrium was actually fairly stable in comparison to previous centuries. So whereas in previous centuries, there was often constant skirmishes and constant jostling for territory between states all over Europe and around the world, in the, in the nuclear epoch, uh, superpowers did not just periodically 
nuke each other's cities. Uh, and and uh, in fact, this, is, this has also been derived from game theory, is that on the whole, the equilibrium was fairly stable. So what's concerning about this coming generation then of, of AI and algorithmic warfare is that it's both offensive and unstable. That is, it often pays to get in the first punch in the fight, but it's also an unstable equilibrium. Because for instance, with cyber warfare, there's constant skirmishes going on between superpowers that has the potential to escalate. Uh, additionally, because decision-making has to be done in small fractions of a second, human beings will increasingly be taken out of a loop. But on top of that, another issue is asymmetric information. And what that means is, if we think about, for instance, terrorist attacks uh, for a moment, the terrorist attacks in Paris and Manchester, for instance, we know who did those, whereas a researcher at one of the main military think tanks in Washington, D.C., recently went on the dark web and was able to download software for drones uh, so that they would attack humans. And so if you think about terrorist attacks in the future, let's say at a music concert, it may well be 10 or 20 drones with machine guns attached to them that are just programmed uh, to kill as many people as possible. But the issue is, we may well never be truly sure who did that. Uh, is it a, a terrorist group or an individual or even a nation state? And when you move beyond music concerts to potentially, let's say, attacks on infrastructure, that, that all becomes, that's all conducive to this becoming quite an unstable equilibrium uh, compared to, for instance, the, the epoch of uh, nuclear weapons. Now, I mentioned the campaign to stop killer robots and their idea that you should always have meaningful human control b behind every military robot. And I talked about why that's going to be very difficult in this age of warfare between swarms of thousands of drones. So I think one of the key areas that we need to think about carefully is what's called entanglement. And this idea comes from a researcher at the Carnegie Endowment in, uh, in the US. And he worked primarily on the idea of nuclear entanglement. That is the idea that your nuclear defenses should not be entangled with your other defense systems. So for instance, in the Korean War, where American and British soldiers actually ended up fighting Chinese soldiers, uh, and perhaps even Russian soldiers, or certainly Russian, Russian pilots, the important thing was that that did not become entangled with the nuclear defenses. And so as we move into this more automated, algorithmic type of warfare and defense systems, the key, will be, the key thing will be that these different levels of our defense systems uh, do not become entangled with each other. Because for instance, there's been a number of cases, including the flash crash of 2010, where algorithmic hedge funds got into a negative feedback loop, and there was just a huge crash in the stock market. Uh, and we can see something like that happening. Bear in mind, it's very difficult for, for human beings to unpick these neural networks. So that will be key to really preventing escalation, is, is looking at ways that we can prevent the entanglement between different levels of our defense systems. So the danger then is really not what's often shown in science fiction of the idea of uh, the AI becoming conscious and attacking us, or at least not in the medium term, as you see in Terminator or, or The Matrix or 2001. The danger really is that as warfare and defense becomes more and more automated, uh, that actually the algorithms will get into a, into a feedback loop with each other. And so to conclude today then, really artificial intelligence is going to bring about a, a new epoch in the history of warfare. Uh, warfare, as I mentioned in the intro, started in the Stone Age with fists and clubs and then move to projectiles like bows and arrows and spears. You could even argue that gunpowder and cannons and even cruise missiles are really uh, just the logical extension of that. Uh, we then had the epoch of nuclear weapons and now this next epoch of automated algorithmic warfare uh, of one form or another, which will involve robots, but also as we've seen cyber defenses.
We've also looked at how the economics of AI is very useful for understanding these coming, coming developments, both in terms of likely progressions in the speed of computer chips, but also some other techniques in economics, for instance, game theory. So as decision making becomes more automated, we can look at, we can look at some of these ideas again. But this inherently makes security very difficult. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, if we think about things uh, in terms of there being four quadrants in the history of different military epochs, I think in many respects we're now moving into a quadrant uh, which is both offensive and unstable. That is, in most of these scenarios, it pays to get in the first punch, um, but there's also constant skirmishes going on. So as, uh, as we look at how to write treaties, uh, the UN is currently meeting periodically, periodically in, in Geneva to discuss these ideas, I think one of the key things will be to ensure that there is not too much entanglement between these areas of constant skirmishes and some of the uh, more destructive levels of defense capabilities uh, that will become possible. So thank you very much, everybody. And does anybody have any questions? So you, you talked about like three waves within AI. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said something about the third wave being Pavlonian. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, the, the second wave. The second wave is effectively Pavlovian. So AI in the second wave, which is what we're in now, essentially learns through trial and error. And the AI uh, designer d defines the utility function or the payoffs, if that makes sense. So it learns similar to an animal that learns through pain. Uh, whereas in the third wave, that's more like human beings, where if you get an electric shock, you understand the context. You don't need to keep touching it you know, 30, 40 times until you get the Pavlovian conditioning. So whereas second wave AI may need thousands or even millions of examples to learn, uh, third wave uh, can be more contextual in its, in its thinking. Actually, the, so the person I mentioned is John Launchbury. And he's, uh, so he was uh, mapping this stuff for DARPA, for the US military, and he's got some good presentations online where he goes through this. Okay, thanks. I have um, uh, two questions. One is um, uh, about the strategy of flexible response, um, which I understand would be a prime example of entanglement, at least in the way it was originally uh, designed. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, my understanding of it was um, uh, that the Western side um, uh, thought it would be able to uh, to escalate into nuclear from a conventional conflict, but then it would, of course, that would run into a credibility gap because it means you're at some point forced to escalate, and if you don't want to do that, you lose your credibility to start with. Uh, so my question is whether my understanding of that one was right. The second question is about um, algorithmic trade and the negative feedback. Wouldn't you need many participants for that uh, in, a, uh, in a situation where you just have two or three actors? Um, it would perhaps be uh, much easier to avoid uh, the, uh, the doom loop, the, the negative feedback. Still a terrible idea to, to have a thousand drones attacking at the same time. Mm -hmm. Those clearly seem to be the tank armies of the second half of the 21st century, no doubt. Uh, but you would still have only very few command centers, and that's perhaps where the analogy with financial market would break down, but I'm not sure. So I think with respect to your first question, uh, there's two issues here. The credibility gap is uh, more of a type of psychological entanglement, let's say, that you have to be prepared to use nuclear weapons. The example that the Carnegie Endowment uses is actually looking at, for instance, Filingdales and other early, def uh, early warning systems. And they're, what they're warning against is that whereas these used to be purely to do with nuclear, they're now looking at multiple domains of potential attack. Uh, and that's the type of entanglement that they talk about. And I suspect with this world that we're moving into, that will have to become more and more the case with all of these different domains simultaneously. Um, and then with respect to algorithms, um, well, I even with two or three players, I think with a kind of tit-for-tat response, it could, it could get into a negative feedback loop. That's good, of course.